I'm a little colorblind, but I can't see the red. Uh, that's okay. Okay, um, so as everybody said before me, um, we know that the salt marshes are important and that we're losing them and we need an, uh, a way to, to predict where future salt marshes may be found and how we might be able to, you know, to do some work to uh, ensure their survival into the future. So uh, to that end, what we've done is we use the SLAM model, the sea level affecting marshes model, to predict where the best opportunities for salt marsh migration will be into the future. Uh, this program's been around for nearly 30 years. It uses a, a kind of a decision tree to, to step through um, changes to cells on, on the ground in a mapping environment in combination with the GIS system. So as Wenli showed, the the types of, of cover, the types of marsh that, that you'll find on the landscape are directly related to their position in the tidal regime from the mean low water, let's see, no I can't see it, um, from the mean low water where anything below that is, is constantly inundated to the upper mean high to the salt boundary where, where there's infrequent inundation. And so what the model will do is take that current condition and to move the water up. And as, as salt marsh converts to tidal flat, brackish marsh to salt marsh, you effectively uh, see those habitats, those marshes move up the landscape uh, vertically and um, up through the, across the land. So, what you need to start the, the, the analysis are a bunch of variables, uh, parameters for the model um, that Wenli covered already um, pretty well, so um, it's a good introduction. Um, but the first one, the first very important variable is the accretion rate. That's the rate at which that material is, is gathered on the marsh to allow it to actually grow vertically and to ideally keep up with sea level rise. For the, this model's sake, um, we used an average number, 3.8 millimeters per year um, that we got from uh, the, the research reserve in Narragansett, Ken Raposa, and it's consistent with kind of an average value for, um, from the literature. So to, to run the model, what we had to do is divide the coastline up into subsites, since there are different uh, characteristics, different places across the coast. In this case, you see 105 subsites, and then different uh, model parameters that we apply to each of those. Things like uh, historic sea level rise, um, the direction offshore, erosion rates, sediment rates, um, storm frequency, and of, of particular importance are the, the tidal data. And there's a bunch of tidal data available. And so what, what we need that for is the, the mean tide uh, level varies depending on where you are in the landscape, um, as does the range of the tide, how far vertically it moves up and down. Um, fortunately, there are a lot of good data sets available, um, NOAA tide gauges. Hey, look at that. I could see that one. Thanks. Nice. Um, NOAA tide gauges, um, Army Corps of Engineer stations, and some other tidal data. And this color that you see in the background from the red to the blue is from a tool called VDATUM out of um, NOAA. And it provides, one, that standardization so that you know where zero is, where the mean tide level is. And two, it also has data derived from some of the tide gauges on, on the range. So what, what this particular color is showing is a higher range of tide in the red areas and a lower range in the blue. So with that information, each of these units is assigned a value and that, that becomes a driving force of where those marshes will be found on the landscape. <laughs> right, and so once you've got your parameters straightened out, you need to input data. And the most important, or probably the most important data set is, is really the elevation. As, as we've seen, the, those, those, um, those habitat distributions are based on the elevation, which drives 
you know, where you are in that tidal regime, how frequently you, you're inundated at a given point. So here we're fortunate to have, um, have had LIDAR flown for the entire state in, in 2011 with you know, accuracy that we can measure down to, to inches um, and this is some, some great detailed information. Uh -huh. And the next important input data is the, uh, the, the wetlands coverage, the land cover, what's, what's currently existing on the landscape. The, the model input has about 20 classes that are simplified a bit on the legend. Uh, but what you see here to really pay attention to are the marshes. This includes the high marsh, the low marsh, and, and some of the, the brackish marsh at the fringe as well, which is, is you know, called for these purposes, you know, salt marsh or, or tidal marsh through the rest of the presentation, and some freshwater wetlands, um, undeveloped uplands, and developed uplands. And so we start from, from these inputs, we can start running the model. And here we have one foot sea level rise, not very dramatic, but you can see some tidal flats starting to work their way in, um, some, some transitional marsh uh, working its way upland. Now, this particular example, if you think back, I should mention in the elevation data, uh, you, you come up against some pretty steep slopes right here. You know, Wenley was talking about the uh, natural barriers as well as, uh, you know, man-made barriers, and, and this certainly qualifies. There's some, some very steep areas right adjacent to the salt marsh, so it doesn't have uh, very many places to go. So at three foot sea level rise, things get a little more dramatic. Um, some of these uh, marshes are, are not keeping up, they're being uh, inundated, open water. There's some opportunity over here, you can see that the marsh is moving upland, um, but, but like I said, there's nowhere for it to go in some of these areas. This form of freshwater wetland has become inundated um, and is, is converted to a saltwater marsh. At five feet of sea level rise, um, this five feet is by 2100. You know, the rate may be different if the five foot was projected out farther than that. But for, for these purposes, this is five feet at, at 2100. You, you can see that there's some dramatic loss. Now, for the maps and some of the atlas, uh, map atlas products that we have um, circulating to the towns, there's a, a bit uh, more information put on top of them to, to assist in the planning efforts. You can see the, the developed areas in the gray, uh, parcel boundaries, existing open space, and wetlands, and a, a simplified legend which just focuses in on the marsh and is, is recoded as um, the potential marsh zone, which is the, the modeled upland area of the, the migration zone, the persistent marsh zone in yellow which is existing marsh that is still modeled to uh, persist, and the, uh, the, the pink color, the purpley pink color, which is marsh loss. So that's at one foot, and I'll run through three feet, and so I'll give you a second to look at that and see it's the same information, only we you live know, at five feet. So with coding the the, the lost marsh is blue, it gives a kind of an accurate representation, at least according to the model, of, of where the open water will be and where the new marshes um, have a potential to, to be into the future. No, I'm sorry. Um, no, so there, you'll, I'll have some more examples later on, maybe you can see a little bit more. Um, you can probably see the pink better than I can anyway. Um, now, one thing that the people are always interested in is, is really the, the inundation modeling and what's going to be underwater. And you do get that out of these maps, but there are better ways of getting at it. Um, the, this, this model's run is really to, to look at marsh migration and to focus on the wetlands. Um, there are a number of inundation models done. This is a particular model just based on uh, the LIDAR data and it's just a, a, a static bathtub model. So looking at given elevations, you know, up to five feet at mean high water, up to the height of the surge from the 38 hurricane, we can see where those, um, where that high water can be found. And, and it matches pretty well, but if you're lo just looking for that information, there are better places. Um, and as Grover mentioned, other models as well, you know, as, uh, 
storm surge inundation models that, that can really look at the dynamics and see the places that are really at risk, um, either from storm events or just from sea level rise. Um, so I've got to talk a little bit about some of the limitations of the model. And uh, some of those are, of course, uncertainty in the sea level rise uh, projections, um, the conditions on the ground. The model doesn't differentiate uh, types of, of ground cover, soils, um, or other than that development uh, factor, which I mentioned earlier. Um, different stressors, stressors on the salt marshes, you know, from nutrients, from, from predation, um, you know, uh, give a, a whole lot. Uh, whole other level of, of, of difficulty in predicting what's going to happen. And the model does, is pretty optimistic when it looks at the inundation of a freshwater wetland and its likelihood of converting to a, to a saltwater wetland or, or, or a marsh when it, it is a possibility with certain conditions that, that they could convert to open water and be too deep to, uh, you know, to, to provide that habitat. And so the model is pretty optimistic in those cases. Um, there are plenty of simplifications in the model. Um, in reality, we, we used an average accretion rate, but they're variable. Um, and there is some variability in the model, but, but you know, it's, it's too complex um, for, you know, for really any kind of model to, to track exactly what's going to happen. And some of the salinity dynamics are, are simplified. But don't get me wrong, I think the model does a really good job of, of identifying the best opportunities. And another big one is the changing coastline. Um, you know, storm events um, you know, reshape the coastline, um, and you know, the barriers in front of the ponds will move forward. And we're fortunate there's another part of this, um, the, the shoreline SAMP, that is addressing that. Um, Dr. Boothroyd and, and Brian Oakley are uh, you know, working on modeling the movement of that shoreline um, with some pretty good detail. And I'm going to, to highlight that, that migration issue a little bit more with a couple more maps. I just picked a coastal barrier here. This is a Kwani Pond uh, in, in Charlestown, Westerly. And we're just going to run through time. See, so focus on, on the barrier here, which is um, beach with salt marsh. And this is titled as Estuarine Beach. It's, you know, shallow sand flat area. Time. As you can see, does make some effort to allow some migration, but what, what happens here, um, and, and, and John could talk to it better than I could, but a lot of this material will be washed over through time, and a lot of what you see here should move forward. That material isn't going anywhere. The model kind of is a in that ultimate lost, and the barrier begins to dissipate, and it kind of disappears until that five foot of sea level rise. It's just a fringe that's opened up, and you know, this is. It is a problem because we don't think it's a very accurate uh, de depiction of what's going to happen. Look at the maps, you'll see a, um, a white cross hatch across the barriers um, saying that the model results are you know, questionable in those areas. Uh, so I've got a few more examples just to run you through. If you can see them, um, this is uh, Foster's Cove in um, Charlestown. Here's the, the LIDAR data, the elevation. What we're looking at, uh, if the colors, each of these contour lines is five feet. Um, so it would give you a sense, you know, five, 10 feet, 15 feet up on, on the, the shoreline. The um, initial condition map, um, one foot um, sea level rise, you know, nothing terribly dramatic, starting to move forward a little bit. Um, three feet sea level rise. I'll just kind of let you look at them, run through five feet of sea level rise. Things get a little more, um, a little more intense, a little more dramatic. This is, this is uh, the Ninigrit um, refuge. You can see, um, you know, some, this is a, a, a fortified wall that's been planted, open water. And again, that final map, looking at, you know, those pinks where there is um, the, the collision of the salt marsh and developed areas. Another example, Palmer River in uh, Warren and, and Barrington. A lot of marsh uh, up there. One foot, three feet, and five. 
5p. So I'll let you look at that. That's pretty much the end of my presentations. Maybe I'll just leave that up there. Take some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Very helpful. A couple questions for Kevin while we're queuing up Jim. You're right here.